From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the name of the Lord is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. I am Pastor Calvin Mills of the Church of God Holiness in Bogus Bay, and I'm delighted to share with you God's wonderful word on this great window that has been available to me to, on JTV to share with you God's powerful word. So call a friend, tell them, tune into the program. God have a word of inspiration for each and every one of us today. Hallelujah. Amen. The last time I spoke to you about Ezra's prayer, amen, he was a man of the word, but he also was a man of prayer, and his prayer indeed was of weeping and groaning and repentance on behalf of a nation that was rebellious, a nation that was taken away captive to Babylon, returned but still did not reform. And of course, such prayer of Ezra led to reformation. Well, today I just felt inspired to continue on the theme of prayer, but this time a different character, one who was in close uh, alliance with Ezra during the same era or era, amen, and that person is Nehemiah because Ezra was instrumental in uh, the restoration of temple worship and more so with the rebuilding of the temple, the restoration of temple worship. But uh, Nehemiah was instrumental in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. But what we will learn is both were great men of prayer. I believe if we would be great for God in anything, we must first be great for God in prayer. Think about that. Yes, my friend, Nehemiah was a great servant leader. He was an action man with an action plan. Yes, however important it is to be an action man and have an action plan, it is even more important to be a man of prayer. Yes, my friend, Nehemiah's book, the book that bears his name, began and closed with prayer. Some nine prayers are recorded in the book of Nehemiah. Oh, my friend, it shows us how important prayer is for the child of God, for the ministering servant of the Lord. And without prayer, we would not be uh, powerful enough, equipped enough to be an instrument in the hands of God. I want to tell you the truth. The prayers of Nehemiah moved God. The prayers of Nehemiah moved God. We don't want to just say great prayer or prayers of great words, but I think more importantly, we want to know that our prayers move the heart of God, moves the hand of God, amen, to operate or function on the behalf of his people that is in need of his divine intervention. Why did Nehemiah's prayer move uh, the heart of God and the hand of God? Well, I believe there's a few reasons, six or seven reasons uh, unveiled in Nehemiah chapter 1 as to why, amen, his prayers moved God. So I want to share with you prayer that moves God. And I pray that your prayer and mine today will move the heart of God and will see the hand of God at work in our lives, in our country, in our territory for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to be reading the text as we go from Nehemiah chapter 1. Amen. But we know the background of the story. Again, Nehemiah was in Persia uh, under the king. Uh, I think it was King uh, Artaxerxes. At that time, he was the king's cup bearer, a servant to the king, a very prominent place and position had to be a man of trustworthy character, amen, to hold such a position because that person had to taste the king's wine and the king's food before the king will partake of his drink and his meal to make certain that there is no one uh, that will work evil to dethrone the king through death. And so it was a protective measure to protect the king. Amen. You had to be a man of character, a trustworthy man. Nehemiah was all of that. 
Hallelujah. And I believe he was strategically placed there in close proximity to the king because God knew he would need such a man to be instrumental in the restoration, amen, of his people in the repair of Jerusalem that it will be no longer a reproach and a shame and disgrace in the face of Almighty God. I want to tell you first of all then, prayer that moves God flows out of a pious heart. Prayer that moves God flows out of a pious heart. Amen. Note verse 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Kislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, uh, the palace. Amen. And of course, he said in verse 2, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Amen. So even though Nehemiah was outside the province of Jerusalem, he was in Persia, yet my friend, his heart was with Jerusalem and its people. Amen. He had a patriotic heart and he had a pious heart because he was unwavering in his faith towards God, though he was in a strange land, though he was in a heathen territory and a heathen, heathen culture uh, under obedience to a heathen king, yet, my friend, he never wavered in his faith. And he had a prominent job in a luxurious palace, attending to a king, but power and prosperity did not get to the head of Nehemiah he knew in whom he believed. Amen. And though he was in the wall, amen, the wall was not in him because he remained separate from the wall and he remained consecrated to his God. Hallelujah. Now that's very important if we are going to hear from God. Hallelujah. And so my friend, although uh, it was uh, he was brought up in a in a, in a luxurious place where no doubt there would be much temptation. Amen. Hobart Locker says he, he remained untainted. He remained untainted. The flames of his piety were kept burning bright despite his worldly good fortune. Amen. Some of us, you know, when we get good fortune, we become corrupt. When we get plenty of money and material thing and we occupy our uh, prominent seats in society, we forget our allegiance to God. We forget our commitment to God. We forget, my friend, our covenant with God. But I'm thankful that in spite of the prominent spot that Nehemiah occupied, he knew his God and he kept his relationship with his God intact. The Apostle James declared the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If prayer is going to move God, we must be loyal in our devotion to God no matter where we are at, no matter in what place we are serving, no matter how uh, prosperous we become, we must keep our devotion to God Almighty. We must be loyal to him. Praise the Lord. And the Living Bible puts it this way. The honest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. It does matter how you live. Yes, my friends. How you live will affect your prayer life. Because the psalmist said, if I in regard iniquity in mine heart, the Lord will not hear me. Uh, my friends, and the Bible also declared God's hands are not shortened that he cannot save, neither his ears stop that he cannot hear, but your sins has separated between you and your God that he will not hear you. So those who will have power in prayer, those who will move the heart of God, 
to grant them his attention and those who will move the hand of God to experience his intervention are to be people of character. Amen. People of loyal devotion who love God with all their hearts, all their soul, their mind and strength and people who are covenant keeping people. People who obey God's word and live for God's honor. Those kind of people will move the heart and the hand of God when they pray. Hallelujah. I hope you are one of those persons. But even if you are not, today could be the turning point in your life when you will repent of your sins, repent of your evil, corrupt character, ask God to have mercy upon you, to clean your heart up, and give you a new heart for a new start, and then you will see how God will work through you as you devote your life to him in prayer. Hallelujah. Secondly, I would say prayer that moves God flows out of a penitential heart. A penitential heart. And when you think of penitence, you think about you know, sorrow for sin, sorrow for offending a righteous, holy, just, merciful, loving, and awesome God. Amen. Of course, when the news hit and Nehemiah inquired about Jerusalem and the people that escaped captivity or the remnant that returned from captivity, amen, he got a very bad report. Amen. That uh, the people were in great affliction, according to number three verse, uh, and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem was broken down, and the gates thereof were burnt with fire. And when he received that sad report about the desolation and the detestable condition of Jerusalem, how it was in a disgraceful condition, uh, as it were, amen, his heart was smitten with sorrow. His heart was smitten with pain. And of course, the fountain of his eyes, amen, overflowed with tears of sorrow. For verse 4 says, And it came to pass when I heard these words uh, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Amen. And of course, my friend, God will turn our mourning into laughter if we will trust him. But sometime before rejoicing comes sorrow. And those who are sorrowful for their sins will experience the joy of sins forgiven when their sorrow leads to repentance. Amen. Hallelujah. Godly sorrow work at repentance not to be repented of, but the scripture says, the sorrow of the world worketh death. Ah, think about that. Amen. So Nehemiah was gripped with sorrow for his own sin personally and the sins of his people. More so, we know it was the sin of the nation as a whole that God allowed the Babylonians to come in and to desolate the, the, the territory of Jerusalem, amen, to take them captive and lead them away into Babylon for 70 long years. And Nehemiah grieved and mourned and wept several days. Ah, my friends, sometimes we have to go through a season of weeping before we can experience the season of rejoicing. And if we are guilty of sin and rebellion, if we are guilty of abominable iniquities, we need to be broken for our sins. We need to be sorrowful for our sins. But oh, my friends, sometimes God would even have those who may not have been guilty of the brunt of such evil crimes against God, though you yourself might have a good standing or a great standing with God. Amen. If you are patriotic, if you have a people concern, uh, a heart concern for people, amen, you will want to confess the national sins and ask God to have mercy upon your nation and upon your territory. And so, my friend, God was moved because this man, when he heard the report, amen, wept and mourn before God several days and he called upon the name 
of the Lord. Amen. Weeping may endure but for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the truth of the fact is the desolated condition of any country, nation, community, territory, or congregation ought to move the heart of the pious, amen, with tears. Ought to move us to go in the secret place and weep between the altar and the porch and ask the Lord to have mercy upon us. And that's what he said that the elders and the prophets and teachers must weep between the porches. Uh, we don't believe just crying just to uh, make an impression on people that we are so pious. No, but genuine tears of sorrow. Amen. God looks for it. Amen. Because they show that there is somebody who is grieved because the nation have offended God, have broken covenant with him and have, as it were, robbed him of the glory that is due his name by getting involved in abominable iniquity. I'm certain there are some concerns and some condition in our own territory that God wants us to weep over, that God wants us to cry over it and cry out to him to even use us to do something about such abominable iniquities in our territory. I'm talking about prayer that moves God. Thirdly, I would say prayer that moves God flows out of a praising heart. Well, of course, you say, well, pastor, you just talk about a heart of penitent, a heart that is gripped with sorrow for sin and sorrow for rebellion and sorrow for the detestable, desolated condition of the territory. But you see, when you address God, you don't start with your problem. You start with God's goodness, God's greatness, God's character, God's attribute. Prayer always begins with God. Amen. Yes, we have problem. Yes, we have need. But when we come to God, we must first acknowledge God for who he is. And people who are only concerned about themselves, concerned about their needs, but who fail to acknowledge God weakens their own prayer. Oh, but even though this man was broken and wounded, he said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, our great and awesome God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So here you say that he is a great God, he's an awesome God, he's a covenant keeping God, he is a merciful God, he is a loving God. And Nehemiah began with the greatness of God. And I know when you are struck with the greatness of your need, uh, when you're struck with that, you must be even more so struck in or stricken with the greatness of your God. Because even as great as your sin is, God's grace is greater. Great as your problem is, God's person is greater. And the greatness of God, amen, is the secret to your assurance that no matter how bad things may seem, no matter how bad things look, God is so great. He's able to do a miracle and restore, amen, that which is broken, that which is leveled to the ground in shambles. God is able to raise it up again whole and brand new because he's a God of restoration. Amen. And people who moves God in prayer, people who are, are struck with the greatness of God and people who will uh, praise him in spite of their troubles, in spite of their burdens. I know that might be a difficult thing for you to do, but the Bible says we must offer the sacrifice of praise, even the fruit of our lips to God. And even though you got problems, you got sickness, you got burdens, you might be broke, busted, and disgusted. You must not just, uh, as it were, uh, see your brokenness, your bustedness, but you must see God amidst of your misery. You must see the merciful, loving, and great, and awesome God who will do wonders in your life if you will only praise Him. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name 
of the Lord. Amen. I'm talking about prayer that moves God. Fourthly, prayer that moves God flows out of a persistent heart. Our heart that persists in prayer. Our heart that practices importunity in prayer. That means you pray and keep on praying. You ask and keep on asking. You seek and keep on seeking. You knock and keep on knocking. There's something about the power of persistence or the secret of prevailing prayer is simply to hang on to the horns of the altar until the answer comes. I know most of us wish that, okay, because I pray about it today, I'm going to get my answer the same moment. Now, God is God. He can answer you even while you're praying. He can overtake your petition with his answer because he's God. But sometimes, my friend, God will test us as to how sincere we are, how hungry we are, amen, for his intervention in our lives. And when Nehemiah approached God, amen, he said, I hear the prayer I have been praying for thy servants Day and night. Look at verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father have house have sin and so he's identifying with them and he's confessing on the behalf of amen his uh, nation amen the people of his nation and asking god to hear this prayer of confession of sin the bible says we confess our sins he faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. He said in verse 7, We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgment which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Amen. So my friend, the man of God here is persisting in prayer. He prayed day and night and he asked God to hear. Glory to God. I'm telling you, my friend, sometime for some national turn around, it called for prayer warriors and intercessors to pray and fast night and day for a season that God will hear and be merciful and, have, and, 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 and intervene in the affairs of the nation. Oh, my friend, don't forget many times it is because of the faithful, loyal, devoted people of God who stay at the altar of prayer. Why, amen, God has been so merciful and so forbearing with us as a people. We cannot take it lightly, my friend. And even when he pour out his wrath or his judgment upon us, amen, our restoration often hinges upon those who will pray, upon those who will cry out to God, upon those who will press their prayer at the altar of God's throne until he hear, answer, and respond, amen. And this great man of God, Nehemiah, amen, prayed night and day and asked God to be attentive to his prayer. I'm saying prayer that moves God also flows out of a promise believing heart. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm talking about a heart that takes God's uh, promises and believe them and stand upon them. Now, the powerful thing about Nehemiah, he pled covenant. He pled covenant. And you know, God is a covenant keeping God. He's a promise keeping God. I know there's an uh, organization called Promise Keepers. Some of us might be upon an uh, informal one called Promise Breakers. I don't know if you're a part of that. But God is a God that keeps his promises. His promises are yea and amen. If he said it, he will do it. If he speak it, he will bring it to pass. And Nehemiah pled the promises of God. Look at verse 8. Remember, I beseech thee. Remember, I beg of you. Remember, I plead with you the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Well, that became a reality. The children of Israel transgressed and they were scattered. They were sent to Babylon for 70 years of captivity and God kept his word. But look, my friend, amen, Nehemiah knew that God kept his word to judge 
when the nation fall into rebellion and habitual wrongdoing and abominable deeds of the territories, uh, my friend, he also knew that if they will repent, he, God, will return. Look at verse 9. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, uh, though they were of you cast unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. God will scatter you and he'll regather you. Sometimes God will break you to pieces and he'll put you back together again. What a God. You see, because when something is malfunctioning and malnourished, like a car engine, sometimes they have to tear it apart to rebuild it. And the nation was so corrupt and poisoned with idolatry and rebellion and abominable iniquities, God had to tear them apart before he can put them back together again. So I, I might be speaking to somebody who feels broken, who feels shattered, who feel wounded because of the hand of God being heavy upon you, judging you, chastising you, my friend. Sometimes if you don't allow your heart to be broken by your sin, you might have to be broken by the hand of God upon you. Lord have mercy. And so Nehemiah pled, amen, pled according to the covenant. He knew God is a covenant keeping God. And what is great about this story, amen, is that Hannah and I, who came and brought the report to Nehemiah. His name means Yahweh is gracious. And Nehemiah's name means comforter. Wow. Amen. Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, amen, came to show himself gracious to a people that was wounded, broken, busted, desolated. And he came to walk through Nehemiah to bring divine comfort to a people that is wounded and bruised, humiliated, and disgraced. Ain't that wonderful? I want to tell you, God shows his greatness, amen, often through yielded servants of his. And I want to wrap this message up by showing you, my friend, amen, prayer that moves God, flows out of a heart prepared to serve, uh, prepared to even be an answer to prayer. Amen. Verse 11, he said, O Lord, amen, back up to verse 10, now these are thy servants, thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. He said, these are your people. You redeem them by your great power. You rescue them from Egyptian bondage. And I know you are able to restore them and repair them. But look what he prayed in verse 11. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants. Yes. Who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah not only saying, Lord, do something about it, but Lord, send me to do something about the desolated condition of my people, my nation, my territory. You see, there are some of us who are praying that God will do something, but we are not availing ourselves for him to do it through us. You see, because many times God don't want us to seek answers to our prayers. He wants us to prepare ourselves to be an answer to prayer. And Nehemiah prayed to God, but he prayed that God will grant him favor in the eyes of the king, that the king will grant him leave to go and rebuild the broken walls and the burnt gates of Jerusalem. What a man of prayer. Most of us don't think like that. Most of us act like prayer is an end in itself. We just go at an altar prayer. We gather for our prayer meetings weekly and we cry out to God and then we do nothing about anything. But I want to tell you the heart that will move God in prayer is the heart that is ready to be used of God to do something about the dilapidated situation, about the desolated situation in the land and in the territory. And I believe God is stroking the heart of somebody listening to me right now and he's saying to you, I want to channel my answer us to prayer through you. God did walk through Nehemiah. God gave show him favor to the king. Nehemiah went and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and restored the gates of Jerusalem with an instrument to bring uh, reformation in the lives of the people. I'm saying it is 
time enough that we not only say prayers, but that we become answers to prayer. Will you be an answer to prayer for the poor? Will you be an answer to prayer for the sick? Will you be an answer to prayer for the hungry and for the homeless, for the discouraged, for the dying? Will you be an answer to prayer today? Ah, if that's your attitude, if you are availing yourself to be used of God, I believe you will move the heart of God when you pray. Because you see, you will not only move God, but you yourself are moved. And you say, move me, Lord, and use me to make a difference in my territory. Father, I bless you for the word spoken today. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we will not just pray because it's something we ought to do, but we will sincerely pray that you will use us as instruments in your hands to bring healing to the nation, to bring healing and wholeness to the broken and the wounded, to bring salvation and deliverance to those that are bound in the name of Jesus, Lord. Hear our prayer and Lord, use us to convey your answers to your people. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. C-O-G-H-B-B at gmail.com or 284-494-1344. Thanks for allowing me this time to inspire you with God's word. And let us be great answers to a great God who will do great things through us because we will pray great prayers. Bye-bye.